<laughs> okay, we're in Sterling, Colorado. It's it's uh, June the 22nd, 2011, and George Gay's with us here. He's a uh, World War II machine gunner, infantryman, and a member of the armed forces that liberated Germany and Europe. And he's going to tell us about his experiences as in the uh, armed forces uh, during that time and anything else he wants to tell us. So we can do that, can't we, George? Sure, try. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're doing good, believe it or not. Okay, now, uh, what's your name? George Gay. George Gay, and uh, uh, when were you born? November 3rd, 1925. 1925. Do you know your service number? Yes. Let's hear it. 37739452. Okay, There's, we've n I've never asked a guy yet about a service number they all know it oh and yeah oh boy god they that were... was required <laughs> oh yeah you need to know that mm -hmm. didn't you yeah so uh that's when you were born where were you born i was born in fairfield nebraska south central nebraska close to hastings near hastings okay mm -hmm. and uh so were you raised there as a yes. child or yes. how, how did that go were you on a farm or what happened no no well our home was at the very edge of town we had two and a half acres, so we was kind of farmers over the back fence was yeah. farmland, but my dad was in the poultry and egg business, and he run his business from home, and but we had cows and the farm animals and yeah. lots of chickens. Did you have to milk the cows? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good farm boy. Yeah. Yeah, even though we didn't have vast acres, uh, we tried to do too much on too little ground. Yeah, that's right. Well, now, did you have any brothers or sisters? I had a brother. He was older than me. Older, uh huh. Mm -hmm. Did he go in the service? Yes. He did too, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, how did you get in the service? I mean, uh, you were in high school there, were you, or something? Yes. Well, uh, Pearl Harbor, I was in high school. Okay. And. Uh, the consensus of the local opinion then was it's these people went to Hastings, bought something in the five and dime made in Japan, was broke by the time they got it home. Right. So they all thought their war machine was going to be similar. Yeah. But it wasn't. No. <laughs> yeah. And you know, they they'd ask me, How old are you, George? And I'd say, Well, I'm sixteen and uh, uh oh, it'll all be over. You'll never get in it. Well, that was wrong. Uh, I had to register uh, on my birthday, my 18th birthday. When you were 18, you registered for the draft? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. And uh, if I remember correctly, that was on a Tuesday. And Friday of the same week, I had my call. Really? Yeah. <laughs> they, they <laughs> didn't were, even, your signature didn't even get dry, did it? No. They, uh, well, things weren't going too well. In the in the war, that was 1943. Right, and uh, they needed men pretty bad, and they they kept dropping the draft age. Right, and of course, uh, 18 year olds was prime crop. Right. So you so you got drafted when you were 18 into the army, mm -hmm. and uh, where did you where did they what happened to you then? Did you uh, well, have to go yeah, somewhere? Or? Yeah, yeah, the, well, we had to go to Omaha for the pre-induction physical. Yeah. And if you was warm, you passed. Right. There's 21 of us that went on this bus. 19 of us passed right away, and they, the other two, they set them by the stove for a couple of days, and they warmed up and passed. And they finally got them too, <laughs> huh? At, uh, the, uh, but the reception center was Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Okay. And you go there and, of course, that's where you get your service record. It had a big old blue stamp infantry before they ever put my name in it. I mean, they wanted infantry. <laughs> and so you was in the infantry. And uh, then I went for basic training in uh, Camp Fannin, Texas. And that was a... Uh, a new camp. 
it had just been bladed off, the tar paper shacks, no laundry facilities, uh, uh, pretty pretty tough going there. Yeah, crude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had some mighty mean sergeants there. Did you? <laughs> were they were the sergeants uh, old army sergeants or were they? Uh, it was all uh, well. In the company I was in, we were kind of divided up into five barracks, and the the oldest guys was in the first and went on down. The eighteen and nineteen year olds was down in the fifth. We was the furthest away from anything. No, I see. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, that was the way we was divided, and of course when they had extra details, they always picked the 18-year-olds because the older guys would talk back to them, you know. Yeah. Tell them go to hell. <laughs> uh, we couldn't do that. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> couldn't get away with that. No. So uh, uh, basic training, I don't remember whether it was 13 or 17 weeks, but it was very rigorous. Uh, I did qualify for the expert infantryman's badge. That's like the combat uh, infantryman's badge, except it doesn't have the wreath around it. Right. The nice part about that, I mean, we were beat into physical shape, <laughs> whether you wanted to be or not, but it paid five dollars more. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, later on when you got the the combat. Uh, infantryman's badge, uh, that was $10, but you didn't get both. The okay, <laughs> one or the other. Mm -hmm. But you had to be an actual combat to get that uh, oh, yeah. get that wreath and everything, mm -hmm. isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was quite a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you were in the Texas camp, mm -hmm. and uh, you guys then, what happened to you then? I mean, how did they... Well, on a... The uh, last day of our basic training, we come in from the field and uh, on the bulletin board was everybody's name, uh, PEO Baltimore for shipment to uh, a replacement depot in Europe. Okay. And uh, you know, that, that was kind of a shock, I mean, pretty new to the Army and here you're going uh, as a, to a replacement depot which was not a good place for 18 year olds. To yeah. Uh, but the next morning, when we got up, went and looked again, and all of us guys that were still 18 was lined out. We were scratched. Congress had acted that day because of a lot of parental deals, you know, an uh, 18-year-old gets sent to a replacement depot where you just requisitioned like ammunition and they were getting killed the very first day. Mm. And uh, so they didn't have anybody on the right or left that knew them, you know, as a bonded buddy and or a mother hen type, you know, to, yeah. to uh, tell them when to do what and so forth. Uh, so. Uh, most of this, there was probably about 50 of us that was still 18, and most of those guys went to a infantry division that was up in Wisconsin that was getting ready to go overseas, and uh, there was six of us went to the 20th Armored Division, and I was one of the six, and they were at Camp Camel, Kentucky. It's now Fort Camel, but. Uh, that's how come I got into the, the 20th Armored Division, and... Now, what was that, the 20th? 20th Armored 20th Division. 20th Armored, mm -hmm. okay, Armored Division, okay, yeah. yeah. There were 16 Armored Divisions in Europe in World War II. Uh, the numbers didn't make a whole lot of difference, but uh, that's the way it was. And uh, when uh, they were getting ready to go overseas also, and uh, we weren't really as, well, they called us basics. And uh, the six of us got all split up. No two of us went to the same place, but uh, I had a real close buddy in the six of us. He did get killed in Europe. Oh. And uh, uh, that, you know, uh, 
that really hits you, you know. And uh, I always felt they had mixed the two of us up. And at one of our reunions, many, many years later, I was able to prove that they had mixed us up. Mixed you up, is mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think God had a hand in this. I mean, the divine intervention that to how this happened because I wouldn't have any reason to believe that I would have been any better soldier than he was. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, they called us basics, and uh, the 20th Armored Division up to this point, they were, it was originated in 1943, but they were a training deal. They would train. Uh, instead of like I went to basic training, you know, and an infantry, yeah, they had their own, and the the non-commissioned officers stayed on, and they'd train a bunch of guys and they'd ship them uh, overseas, and uh, the uh, the non-commissioned officers they they had it made there. Yeah, uh, a lot of them had their wives living in town. They lived in town, had their cars. They'd drive out to do their thing just like a job. Yeah. And uh, uh, when the word got out that, hey, they're not shipping out a bunch of people, everybody's going. Uh, oh, really? Uh, uh, they uh, they kind of suffered. You know, yeah. they had to take their cars home, send their wives home. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was something new for them. Yeah. And uh, they weren't... Uh, Oh, like a, a squad leader or a platoon leader, he wasn't particularly anxious to take on uh, any basics. You know, the, uh, the strength of the division, uh, the table of organization called for 10,000 men. When we went overseas, there was 11,000. Uh, so this extra thousand was guys like me. And uh, so uh, he got put in the a platoon or a squad, and, and uh, uh, actually they kind of took advantage of you. When they found out they was going overseas, their regular guys that had been their, their people, hey, I'm not going to put him on any details, I'll put this new guy on. The new guy got it, and that was you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, it was not unusual to have Saturday night guard, Sunday KP, uh, or anything that come up, and, uh, and of course, uh, an armored division is well. Everything is on wheels or tracks, so there's a lot of vehicles. Yeah. And of course, the the motor pool, and and of course, a lot of guns. And uh, as the details would come up of what they needed, uh, I could count on. I'll be sent on that one. I got sent down to the arms room, which was in the motor pool. And uh, the armorer and his assistant, they were nice guys. Uh, it was kind of a good deal to be working with them. We had a lot of work to do. We had to tear every gun in the company down, inspect it, repair it, uh, cosmoline it, and crate it. To everything but the rifles, you know, any any gun that any, we carried our, our guns onto the ship and so forth. But uh, there was a lot of work involved and it was long days. Uh, start early and work till about 10 o'clock. <laughs> Get back to the barracks and find you going on guard duty at, at midnight. Uh, oh. <laughs> so uh, apparently these fellows, they liked my work, and they said, uh, you know, Sergeant Bauer's gonna kill you. And I said, I ain't gonna let him. Uh, he says, you know, we can stop that. If it's okay with you, we'll just call for you every day. And he won't be able to touch you for all of this crap that he's getting you involved with. Oh, yeah. So, uh, that was a good deal for me. I got off of guard duty in KP. Yeah, <laughs> and, right. Uh, it put in a lot of hours, but it did give me an opportunity to uh, learn virtually all of the names of the guys in the company. There's about 250. Yeah. Because you had the gun that they had, the serial number, and 
you'd match the names and so forth. So uh, by name, I got acquainted with a lot of people that I wouldn't have otherwise yeah. uh, got acquainted with. And uh, so it was kind of a foregone conclusion that once we got overseas, I'd stay with this the armored, armored. Yeah, armored division, yeah. Or armored. Uh, armored, uh, well, the, the armorer and the assistant, you know, taking care right. of the guns and so yeah. forth. That only lasted a few days. We got a lot of work done, but uh, a few days later, the captain had us all fall out, and he says, uh, all of you basics fall out. There was 20 of us in the company. I was standing fifth in line of, of 20, and of course I'd had old line company infantry basic training, so I knew the, the makeup, and uh, if you go one th through five, you know, U5 to the first platoon, U5 to the second, third, and fourth, that was machine gun squad, and I, I did not like the machine gun <laughs> in basic training. That, uh, and I thought, well, uh, we got to run across this area to get into the platoon that you're assigned to, and I thought, I think I can make it to the fourth squad, even though I'm in the fifth, I can run faster than this guy beside me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we, we take off on a mad dash to go to the platoon that he was assigned to. And I was ahead of him maybe a couple of steps, and about that time he fell, and the, the mud in France is greasy and slick. He just slid right into the fourth squad, so I... <laughs> so Slid home, huh? Yeah, so I ended up uh, in the fifth squad, the machine gun squad, and I was number 13 in the squad. 13, oh boy. And uh, <laughs> the squad leader, uh, staff sergeant, uh, oh, he was a tough looking guy. He was an alcoholic and he uh, said, uh, you know, we don't need you. Well, I said, good, I'll go home. Oh, like hell you will. Yeah. <laughs> so he says, you're just gonna be an extra rifleman and uh, your job would be watch out for me and uh, maybe keep an eye open for liquor if you see it for me. That was going to be my job, be his <laughs> bodyguard and so forth. Well, uh, I don't think we'd gone any more than two weeks and we, we lost our platoon sergeant. And uh, so they gave him the platoon. Well, that was overseas? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so did you did you go overseas on a ship? Is that it? Yes. You shipped over, uh -huh. and where did you land in Europe? La Havre. Huh? La Havre. La Havre. Okay. The, uh, so see, we missed the invasion. Right. And uh, so you were there after D-Day and, right. and all that stuff. And uh, La Havre had been captured, but it was all blown up. Yeah. And uh, I got terribly seasick. Fifteen days gone on over. that ship. Yeah. It it was pretty rough water. There was. 13 ships in the convoy, and I never seen any of the other ships until we was a day from France. The water so, was... It was so rough and foggy and everything. Yeah, and of course they zigzagged, and we uh, we did have a submarine scare uh, on the last day. It was getting close to France. Yeah. And. Uh, it was then when I seen other ships, and I, I was amazed at how fast that Navy destroyer could cut around Shut us. Shut around, yeah. Uh, it, it, they were throwing a lot of depth charges off of this. It, it was a little banana boat that we went over on. <laughs> was it? Uh-huh. They said we looked as green as the bananas they used to haul. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the sides of that thing, if you're down below, it, they seemed like it might have been starched Reynolds wrap, you know, they were shaken with those depth charges. Yeah. This ship had been hit once, but they saved it and patched the, the torpedo hole. Oh, really? And, uh, but uh, the, uh, the Navy claimed they got a kill on this submarine. Of course, we didn't know. Yeah. But, uh, uh, so we uh, 
we pulled into, uh, there was no port left. It was all blown up. Uh, so they got up as close as we could, and of course we had to unload blackout. It was about three, two or three o'clock in the morning, black as could be. <laughs> and we had to go over the, the side on uh, rope nuts, and then they had uh, what looked like big square tanks tied together with about that much distance between them. That was, you know, a floating Float, dock. Floating dock sort of thing. And huh? uh, uh, after being sick, and I crossed the Atlantic on maybe a dozen soda crackers, <laughs> 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 carrying everything we own going down that, uh, that rope net. I thought, boy, I'll never make it. I'll be a grease spot at the bottom, but I did. And uh, of course, uh, totally dark, couldn't really see anything. And our captain uh, was down there and he uh, pointed us in the direction that we was to walk and eventually we'd come to ground. And, and uh, uh, I turned around and started going and some other captain came up and he had one of them long flashlights. He got it right up in my face and he turned it on. Yeah. Oh, he couldn't see anything. Yeah. I stepped between. <laughs> on one of those cracks? Mm-hmm. Uh, with one leg. Yeah. I went down so fast, my steel helmet was still up here. It come down and hit me on the head. Oh, my God. And my head was against the, the steel <laughs> deal that uh, I very distinctly remember that helmet on edge rolling and went down the next one, like glug glug. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, all I had left on my head was a little little cap you wore under your helmet, had no helmet. And uh, uh, Captain Joe, he, he come and picked me up and he asked me if, if I was hurt. And I said, no, my, my leg is a little scraped from the top of my boot on up, but I'm okay but I don't have a helmet. He says, don't worry about it, we'll get you one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we started walking and we walked till, oh, past dawn. And uh, in this walking, they would pass stuff up from the rear and I seen a, a steel helmet and a liner coming up and I thought that can't be mine. But, you know, he had to pass it to the guy ahead of you. And, yeah. And I looked in that thing, last four numbers of my serial number and my papers in the lining of the... Hat or the so helmet? I don't know. I have a suspicion that maybe Captain Joe took that other captain by the ankles and said, you get that helmet up. But uh, I'd never, ever heard a, a captain talk to another. He grabbed him up here by the neck and nearly choked him. Oh. And he says, shine that light, and another one of my men, well, he fairly well informed him where he'd be wearing that flashlight. <laughs> Got after him about and, it. Uh, so um, we, had, uh, we had good officers. Um, Did you? Well, that's, that's helpful. Yeah. And uh, so uh, about sunup time, they picked us up with some trucks, so we weren't walking anymore, and uh, we went to, oh, supposedly a, a safe area, and we'd, you know, get the rest of our equipment. See, uh, our vehicles were predominantly half tracks. Okay. We did have some six by sixes and jeeps, but the half track was, you know, what the individual squad would have. In other words, there would be 12 of us to this particular half-track. And uh, Those half-tracks had a, what, a machine gun on them or something like that? Ours had a, a mounted 50 caliber uh, machine gun. Yeah. And uh, our, our machine guns, we had two uh, 30 caliber air-cooled, and that was what uh, I ended up with. Uh, I was, this extra rifleman bit didn't last, <laughs> and uh, in this squad there was a fellow that he had been a sergeant and had been busted back to a private, 
<laughs> so they give him his stripes back and he took over the machine gun squad. So uh, he was quite a talker. He says, there are going to be some changes here. And he started rattling off and I heard this, Gay's going to take gun number two, which was one of the 30 caliber. And I don't want that machine gun. I don't like machine guns. <laughs> I'm, I'm satisfied with a rifle. And he says, uh, you will take that or I will court-martial you. Oh, told you that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I says, well, if I have to take it, you'll have to tell me why. He says, you want to know? I says, yeah, that's what I ask. He says, well, <coughs> as you know, I was a sergeant before and I run around with all the NCOs in the company and I was very well acquainted with the armor and his assistant and I know about you. Oh, that was a deal. I said, what do you know about me? He says, well, for your information in this entire squad, you're the only one that could take that gun apart in the dark, put it back together, and it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was doomed. I, I had to take it. Yeah. So, uh, that's how I got to be a machine gunner. That's it. You, you were appointed. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, never volunteer in your point. Yeah. Well, so, uh, so then you guys uh, half-tracked out of there, half-tracked to the front, or mm -hmm. uh, yeah. did you immediately uh, go into action, or what uh, happened then? Not, not right away. I mean, uh, uh, we had all a little bit of stuff going on uh, while we were still in France, but it was... You, you could figure it is, you know, a collaborator or uh, something like that. Uh, we had left this area, and when we come back, the, the well was booby-trapped, and uh, every once in a while in the night, there'd be a few pot shots, you know. Uh, so uh, there was plenty of guard duty there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, I can tell you kind of a funny story there, if you yeah. got here. Just tell us the story. Well. Uh, this was the scariest place in the whole wide world. There was uh, a lot of trees, but it was an old French chateau. It was pretty large. Most of the company was in that, that building, but it was scattered others like me. We were, uh, there was kind of a yard with, oh, there would be various shops and uh, you know, like you'd find on a farm and uh, the one I was in was an old machine shop, the dirty as could be. <laughs> but uh, on this particular night, uh, they would only have two of us, uh, or, but we couldn't walk together. We had to be 180 degrees apart, so we had to go around this this whole place. Or do the perimeter. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But that that day, they had hauled in, you know, we were getting ready to go, they hauled in tons of ammunition, and they piled that in the trees out away from the chateau and the other buildings. And they said, don't walk guard out there. Uh, you know, it might be a giveaway if they see a guard, you know, guarding something out there. It was, it was hidden. Yeah. So uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up, uh, start on guard, and uh, we had to be 180 degrees apart, and it was the first round, and I went around the chateau, and made the turn, and came up on the back side of it. It was a long building, and I heard footsteps uh, out towards that ammunition pile, and uh, this kind of kind of bothered me. I mean. Ain't, none of our guys are going to be out there footstepping around yeah. at <laughs> 2 o'clock in the morning. I'd stop, the footsteps would, would stop. You'd stop and the footsteps would stop? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, we were aware of every atrocity that the Germans ever pulled. You know, if, if they found something new, we always knew what they did, you know. Yeah. But uh, they had a neat 
little knuckle knife that they could open your throat uh, with uh, just pretty handily. And uh, so I thought, yeah, I'm going to slip the bayonet on here. I don't want, I don't dare fire my gun. Uh, I'll give away my position, and I might hit something out there in that pile of ammunition. Yeah. <laughs> and we'd blow France away. And so uh, I slipped the bayonet on very quietly on the, my rifle and took the rifle off of safety. And uh, I could do all of this just real quiet and take a few steps, and I'd hear steps, and I'd stop. It would stop. And, uh, I thought, there's somebody out there. And, you know, I had a pretty rough basic training. I figured, I got that bayonet. We had extensive bayonet training. Uh, I think I can handle him, you know. And uh, <laughs> I got closer and closer to the, well, I'd be the northwest corner of the chateau. And, uh, I began hearing multiple footsteps. I said, there must be two out there. I'm not going to let either one of them get behind me. I had it all figured out what I, he's, he's going to rush me. I'm going to go down with my gun butt there, 45 degrees band on, and let him impale himself on there. <laughs> and so it was just, you know, this was the time. and. It uh, just a, in the, well, maybe I was seeing a little bit more in the dark then, but a big old white hog about that big shot through me, right by me. A great big what? Hog. Oh, a hog. Oh, a hog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was uh, quite an evening. Yeah. The, uh, and of course, uh, the other fellow, he was clear on the other end. He. He didn't even know this was Here's, happening. Yeah. And uh, I guess we could have had bacon for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was kind of a funny, it was just dead serious at the time. Oh, yeah. Well, you just don't know, do you? I mean, no. that, that's fearsome. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, oh, I remember uh, Easter, a chaplain found us, and we had uh, Easter Sunday on Saturday, uh -huh. and uh, Sunday we kicked off a big drive, and I guess that drive kept up until uh, the war was over. It, uh, uh, we went uh, into Germany uh, close to Aachen. When we were about eight miles from Aachen, I seen one of these uh, daylight air raids uh, with the bombers, there were so many in the sky that the ground actually shook. Really? Yeah. And uh, those guys did quite a job on on Germany. They kind of tore. Now up. you're talking about Allied planes or yeah. or German planes? No, uh, Allied planes. Allied. Okay. And uh, as we went on, uh, we didn't run into. Uh, too much stuff from the Luftwaffe, the, the German era. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the thing that uh, we had to watch if we were in convoy, uh, my TO position in the half track was the last seat back on the right side. My job was to kick the latch on the back door and be the first out with a machine gun, but being at the, at the back, you had to keep an eye peeled for any German aircraft, they like to get at the tail end of a convoy and then machine yeah, gun come down. The, uh, yeah. Machine gun down the, the right. And of course, it's your job to holler at the driver. You know, uh, get off the road and get at a right angle. And uh, uh, but we didn't have very much trouble with. Uh, we had bed check Charlie that uh, always knew where we was at. He'd fly over at low altitude. And uh, when we were at various times, we were attached to every army that was in Europe. You oh, know, yeah. Patton's Third Army, and uh, we were in the Seventh Army when we took Dachau. 
But uh, when we was in the Third Army, Patton's Third Army, uh, he was a pretty rough general. I mean, he just didn't get much sleep. Yeah. He'd uh, go like hell all day long and think, you know, might get an hour or two rest tonight. Uh-uh. He's going to move. We'd move a hundred miles in the night. A hundred miles? Mm-hmm. Is that right? Uh, his theory was that Bedchuck Charlie knows where we're at. He's going to move all of this armor a hundred miles and it'll look like uh, we got more armor than we actually do. Oh, yeah. And of course, a half track looks at a distance, sounds like a tank. Yeah. Know? And uh, so we made some nasty moves. We never, never knew where we was at or any maps or anything like that. Uh, so, uh, oh, uh, one night uh, we found, uh, you know, you always had to find gasoline for the half track. It, it loved gasoline. <laughs> and of course we carried several cans with us, the five yeah. gallon cans, but we found a, a gas dump where they just put out rows and rows of, and we gassed up, and, and we just got out of there before Kept they, going. Uh, well, they hit that just right after we left. Really? Mm -hmm. Had a big bonfire. Blew it up. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then the idea was you attack at dawn. And, you know, you're in no shape to, you're so tired from, from all of that. Uh, moving all night long and then it's supposed to be fresh as a daisy and yeah. attack at dawn. Yeah. And if you fall asleep on your gun, you will be court-martialed. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. George, don't rub your hands over that way. Yes. Anyway, why, yeah. So, uh, so you got, okay, you were, you were advancing rapidly. Mm -hmm. And was that in Patton's army, so to speak, or? Well, in, in every one that we was in, uh, I mean, we'd be attached to, to one or Various army. ones. Yeah, but uh. Uh, about the same uh, thing uh, with, uh, uh, we were moving and uh, we uh, maybe moving too fast for our own good, you know, as you move too fast, you can, you can get cut off. Yeah, you extend over your supplies, mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I understood that part of that advance, that real fast advance, ran out of fuel and stuff yeah, like that, and there was, was a it problem. Was it was dangerous. Yeah. And of course, uh, if we were in a, a column of half tracks, uh, we, we generally tried to use roads, but sometimes there was no bridge or yeah. uh, some of this was field work. But uh, if, uh, if you blew a, a bogey wheel, uh, that would that was the cast iron wheel with the bonded hard rubber that rolled the, the tracks. Tracks are on, yeah. Uh, and they would get overheated and they'd blow that rubber off like you had a blowout on a car. So we'd have to stop. It was about a job about like changing the tire on a car to put on a, a spare. Put and on a new wheel or yeah, new. Yeah, we had uh, one or two with us all the time. And, uh, but uh, you, you drop out of the column to do that. Yeah. And then you, you got to catch up, you know, so you, you yeah. don't uh, do anything but hurry. Yeah. And maybe they only went a half a mile, pulled into a forest or something, and we go zipping on down the road, we'd find ourselves out. Ahead. By yourself. Yeah, ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't so good. No. So you went across France, and did you go across Germany too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you ended up we, we north had, of Munich. We we ended up kind of starting out north. We cut across the corner of Holland. Oh, uh, across the corner of what? Holland. Oh, Holland. Yeah. Okay. And, and of course we were in Belgium. Yeah. And. Uh, after that, we we went more to the south. It was kind of on a old pattern, like he's going to Munich. You know? Yeah. And 
that's uh, when we came across Dachau. Dachau, yeah. And, uh, now, did you did you have a lot of? Uh, I mean, how did you have a lot of fighting in there? And uh, well, were the Germans. Uh, uh, I would say uh, most that we run into was pretty pretty light resistance. Yeah. Uh, were the Germans uh, surrendering? Yeah. Yeah, they were starting to surrender then. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you got the when you got the dock, and now you got the dock out, and you were the first people in the Dachau. You were. Mm -hmm. What happened then? What what happened? Well, Dachau. I Dachau was a prison camp. Mm -hmm. Some people may not know this. Dachau was a it was built, German it prison was, camp for Jews. It was or, built in 1933 when Hitler came into power. Yeah, it was it. Yeah, and uh, we had no idea that it was there. Yeah. But to to get on us, I put her have to start with the day before. Yeah, we'd been making one of these uh, rapid advances and right. uh, uh, not not too much resistance. We were making good time, and uh, it was uh, we'll get in the evening prob probably about six six thirty, and of course I'm observing to the back and I see a, a jeep coming up passing the, the column and uh, right away I knew that it wasn't one of ours. Uh, we had a general whose life had been saved because he was in a sandbagged vehicle. So everything was going to be sandbagged in the division in case of landmines. Well, as this jeep, uh, it was flying right along and come up, uh, knew right away that there was four MPs in it. And uh, uh, we had MPs, but we'd left them way back someplace. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but they passed us up, and they got up ahead of the, the column, and they hit a landmine. Oh, wow. Into them. Well, of course, that stopped the column. Yeah. And. Uh, knew that we were in mined territory. Right. So uh, they decided that uh, we'll pull off of the road and we'll dig in for the night. And uh, we, <laughs> we were in a peat bog was where we was at. And, and of course, uh, digging a foxhole with that little belt shovel is almost mission impossible. Uh, do a prone shelter that just gets you below the surface of the ground, and you're so tired, you know. That, and of course, I was on guard duty that night too. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it was determined that uh, our, our half tracks could do, go no further. Uh, a half track was an expensive vehicle, had very little armor. Uh, sides was only about three eighths of an inch, so. And going to leave the, the half track back, uh, call up the tanks, and we was going the rest of the way on the back of the tank. A, With a, tanks. A, huh? a tank and infantry uh, marriage type of thing. We was going to ride the tanks. So there was an awful lot of confusion that day. And uh, at that particular point, we were about 45 miles from Dachau, but we didn't know it. You didn't know it, yeah. And uh, so, uh, how far were you from Munich then? I mean, was were you well, uh, further than that? Uh, Munich would have probably been about another twenty miles. Okay, yeah, and it was pretty close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so uh, we loaded everything, you know, onto the tanks. Uh, I couldn't do it today if I had a stepladder, but I walked up the back of that. Sherman tank carrying a machine gun and several boxes of ammunition, and I had an M1 rifle. I should have had a carbine because I was a machine gunner. You know, they had a lighter. It was about half the weight of an M1. Yeah. But I still had the M1. They gave us plenty more ammunition, and I think they shoved about uh, three cans of sea rations in, in your backpack and climbed up on that tank, and I was on the the third or fourth tank, and we took off. And the, the first one, 
he did a lot of sashaying around, and he, he hadn't hit a mine, so everybody stayed in the... <laughs> kind of his tracks, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we ended up getting back up on the road, and they were running those tanks just absolutely full bore wide open. And uh, they'd, uh, they use a lot of gas, but they would, they would always get up with gasoline for us, and a six by six with five gallon cans of gasoline. And of course, we'd all grab a can of gasoline and open it and dump them, just fling the can off. They'd have to pick them up uh, after we and on the road again. And uh, the tank I was on blew a, a boogie wheel, but you didn't stop to change it. Uh, it'd be like running on a flat. Uh, we just kept going. And uh, uh, the tankers were pretty nice guys, you know. They'd open up the hatch and they'd talk with us. And <laughs> but you were sitting on the outside. Yeah. Yeah, right. And, and of course, How many guys were on a tank, would you guess? I mean, when you had your machine gun on that? And oh, there, each, there was probably about 10 of us guys. 10 of you riding on the tank. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. And hanging on for dear life. Yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, they had radio connections with in between tanks. Yeah. So uh, they'd, they'd say, you guys be ready, there's something coming up, and they'd latch up. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, in that day, we've seen a lot of things. Uh, the, uh, I thought I was in the wrong war at one time. The Germans were apparently running out of everything. They had an old uh, World War I horse-drawn artillery pieces, and uh, that's no match for an armored column. Yeah. I mean, they were... They were Wipe them out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... What caliber were the guns on those tanks? What were those? Oh, uh, uh, they had machine guns and... Uh, but they have 30 caliber machine guns. Yeah, and... Uh, and then the, the big gun, I think, was a 76. Millimeter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, just go ahead. I just, just curious. And uh, so uh, we just kept going and going. And uh, that afternoon, uh, we started seeing fence. Like, that ain't what you keep cows in with. That was the fence at Dachau. Around that. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it was a big place and it, you know, had several factors to it. So uh, there was a lot of wild claims of who was there first and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. That. <laughs> and who went through the gate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think we waited to get to the gate. I think that we just went through the fence. Yeah, and, just plowed through, huh? And we pulled up to the, to the gate area eventually and we dismounted. And, uh, oh, what a sight to see. I mean, uh, I have some pictures in the book there that you can look at. It uh, yeah. might spoil your dinner. But, uh, the, uh, uh, and, and, of course, this place was heavily guarded. I mean, they had their guard towers, and, you know, some of those guards fell out of those towers. It's acute lead poisoning, I think it was. Wait, what? Acute lead poisoning. Yeah, they had a problem. <laughs> uh, yeah. And of course, the Nazi flag was flying there, and we put a few bullet holes in that, I'm sure. And uh, the motor officer of the company I was in has that flag today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, actually, uh, I was in the camp. Uh, just, uh, well, you'd have to call it minutes. Uh, I mean, of course, the smell and, and everything you've seen, it didn't take minutes, you know. But they, uh, they said the, the first, is either 10 or 12 tanks mount back up. Well, I was on three or four, so we had to mount back up on the, and said, you guys are going on to take the city of Dachau. And uh, so uh, this actually was a break, but it didn't seem like it at the time. Uh, we, uh, oh, we probably went 
three or four miles and was on top of a hill and from there you could see Munich and of course uh, you could see the Germans trying to get their airplanes in the air and they was lobbing in a lot of artillery and all of that. And then uh, we took off again, we went south and we came onto the city of Dachau and there wasn't a single white flag out. Not that we would have trusted it if we'd seen it, but I thought, boy, we're getting in too much of a hurry. I wouldn't do it this way, take all the tanks right down the street with the infantry on the outside, you fly on a tea kettle. And uh, my idea would have been take the tanks down the street, but split the infantry in half. Let the guys walk behind. Or, well, uh, yeah. you know, you could cover the other side, you yeah. know, because there were two and three story windows there. Yeah. And uh, you expect to hear the tinkle of glass and the machine gun uh, out. And they had some terrific machine guns, it just, uh, Oh, they could fire a hundred rounds, just like a big burp. And uh, but uh, we got through town, and uh, the uh, there was a bridge there over the Anapa River, and we were to hold that bridge at all costs. Well, here again, I thought we take half the tanks across and leave the other half. You know, <laughs> took them all across. Oh yeah, and <laughs> the, uh, we dismounted and went back into, or started back into Dachau, the city of Dachau, on foot. Well, the Germans had the high ground, and they had 88s and machine guns. They opened up on us. Yeah, I bet. And they evaporated the street just just yards ahead of us. The the particular cut of the ground uh, saved our bacon. <laughs> we were in kind of a cut, and they couldn't actually tell exactly where we was at. They knew that we were there, but uh, they couldn't bring any fire, <coughs> really concentrate on us. And <coughs> so <coughs> we seen the, the, uh, this bridge, and uh, I, <coughs> I think truly we would have held that at all costs. But uh, we've seen this, it looked like a real substantial big tall house kind of up the hill. And we thought, yeah, if we get to that house, we might be able to see where they're coming from and do something about it. So we made it up to that house and helped ourselves to live in there. <laughs> and it wasn't but just a few minutes and apparently they had used up all of their AP shells and had nothing left but flak for aircraft. They flacked that house like uh, we was in a Colorado hailstorm. <laughs> Is that right? Oh well, yeah. We realized that we couldn't uh, hold there. So uh, we made our way back down so we could be close to the bridge. And uh, uh, we did hold the bridge. Uh, now you all were just, uh, you were all on foot or? Yeah. yeah. You didn't have any vehicles or anything? No, no, no they all, parked you, the tanks. You all doing it on, yeah, okay. Yeah, we were on foot. Yeah, so. And uh, the. Uh, uh, you want to take a break? Yeah. Stop. So, so you guys were on foot, and we, and holding... we was right down on the river bottom. What was that river? Amper River. Amper. Okay. Okay. We didn't know it. Yeah. We, we drank water out of it, but a couple of weeks later, we found out don't drink water out of the Amper River. It can't be purified because of the prison camp. Oh, it was that bad? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh man. But uh, we drank it. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, but uh, it wasn't until after dark that I realized that I really got a break there, that I wasn't in the bunch that stayed at the prison camp. We we went on this other, we could have all been killed, you know, but, yeah. but uh, the moon was coming up in the east and from the uh, river bottom I looked up and I seen what looked like another moon 
coming up in the northwest. And there's only one moon, you know. It, uh, <laughs> what it reminded me of was in Nebraska in the thrashing times, the big tall straw sacks would occasionally get struck by lightning and they'd burn on the horizon and it'd be just like moon coming up. Yeah. You know, uh, but uh, the moon was in the east and this was in the northwest. And these poor guys that didn't ride in this first 10 or 12 tanks, they had to stay in the camp and they had to pile up dead bodies and pour gasoline on them and burn those. Oh man. Uh, and that's what, what they said. That was what was going on. Mm -hmm. Wow. I don't know whether I could have handled that or not. I mean, well, that was pretty rotten. Oh yeah. Putting it mild like that. Yeah. Uh, those prison camps, you mm -hmm. know. And but, uh, we, we held the bridge all night and uh, they were on the, up on the hill and every once in a while uh, they'd rip off some rounds with their machine guns. They'd fire tracers and they'd be firing about oh, eight or nine feet uh, higher than our heads. And you know, Krauts, we're not exactly amateurs at this. Uh -huh. We know what you're gonna do. You can switch that belt, drop that gun down and come up with ammunition that hurts, you know? Yeah, sure. And uh, so we didn't, we didn't fall for any of that. And we, we stayed uh, pretty low. And about four o'clock in the morning, our artillery, which was behind us, uh, they lobbed some big stuff over us and that shut down uh, all the stuff we was getting from Cool them. that off a little yeah. bit, huh? And, uh, and then uh, we were on the road to Salzburg. We took Salzburg. And of course, we knew, uh, we knew the Germans knew that we knew and vice versa, a lot of art and all of that in Salzburg. And I think they got the drift that the war was just about over. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, there was only 10 days left. You shoot at us, we'll just disassemble Salzburg for you. It was taken without a shot. So that was kind of unique. Yeah. So there was a, they, they didn't attack and got, things were getting towards the end and everything. Yeah, that, well, uh, the, the day that we were making this big drive on uh, Dachau, uh, they were surrendering like nobody's business. Yeah. If they had a truck, it would be overloaded with, and they, they knew enough to put a white hanky up. And uh, we'd just pass them like he was out here on the on the. They were going to the back or yeah. trying to surrender. Yeah. Uh, that's something for the artillery to do. They're behind us. Yeah. Know? <laughs> and uh, so uh, that, uh, well, my my good buddy was killed on April the 29th, 1945. That was the same day that we took Dachau. Is that right? Uh, yeah, and uh, the, uh, uh, it, uh, oh, we had various little incidents uh, from there until the, end of the war. Uh, I can remember the, the last day of the war, if you want to hear that. Yeah, let's, let's hear about uh, it. We'd been on another one of these drives and uh, not not too much resistance and uh, we'd, uh, well, we were always assigned, we were spread really thin, you know, take a town and it'd be a little town and you know, if there's any military there, you have to take care of it, but you have to go through every building to make sure, and every weapon has to be uh, picked up. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> uh, we, uh, we had well, quite a few days of that, and uh, the, uh, but the last day of the war, uh, we had come on to this well, we, we were down south now, and this was more farming area, and it, it wasn't all blown to pieces like northern Germany. So we appropriated some chickens. Got the eat. chickens, yeah, okay. And uh, 
we took over a house, you know. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and looked in the basement, see if there was anything to eat. And uh, we seen some jars on the shelf that uh, it looked like lard. And I thought, we can fry chicken in lard, you know. <laughs> so we got it. it we was cooking indoors. We fired up the range in the kitchen, you know, and we had skillets and we cut up the chickens and scooped the those jars of what we thought was lard in there and, <laughs> and throwed the chicken in and, oh, we were hungry. And the guys from the South says, you know, you talk about southern fried chicken, I've never seen southern fried chicken brown as nice as that is. <laughs> Everybody, my mom had always taught me it takes an hour to fix a chicken. Yeah. Well, it hadn't cooked an hour, but everybody was grabbing for a piece of chicken. Yeah. It was sickening sweet. That was honey. Oh. And <laughs> so we did it before Colonel Sanders did. <laughs> but uh, later in, in the night, uh, they did get some mail up to us. Mail was something that you really waited for. and right. uh, Sometimes you'd go six weeks without mail and my folks at home same way mm -hmm. but I, I would always uh, write uh, regular they'd get a whole bunch of letters yeah. but the, the six weeks that they wouldn't hear her, that you know as a parent I, you know I wasn't a parent then but since uh, yeah. I can see how this would you know just uh, but in the mail that we got one of the guys uh, got word that his brother out in the Pacific had been killed. Oh. And it was like I had a brother out in the Pacific. Yeah. And uh, it was like we all lost a brother. There was no wild celebrations or anything like that. I mean, the end of the war. And uh, it was thankful and grateful for that. But, uh, you know, when this fellow lost his brother, yeah. we all lost a brother, you know. They do? Well, uh, it was like, you know, it was like if I would have lost. Oh, if you would have lost your brother, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so uh, that uh, that was the, the end of the war. Uh, oh, we had some other little deals in, in those last few days that uh, this motley machine gun squad of ours <laughs> captured a and destroyed a German tank, believe it or not. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, we were spread so thin. The night before, uh, so much of our work was away from the company, and maybe you'd go on a, a deal to outpost a broken down tank or something like that, and then from there, you're supposed to find your way back to the company or go do something else. So we were away from the, the company a good deal of the time. Our, our story in this machine gun squad was probably different than anybody else's story. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, the, the, the day before, they were pushing us so hard. Uh, you know, one squad of 12 guys and take a town, period. And no, no white flags up, you didn't know what you were getting into. Yeah. But it was always, <clears throat> you clear the town, which takes a little time, you go through every building and- uh, Check it out. Check it out. Yeah. And you think, boy, there's a nice place to get some sleep there. <laughs> right. <laughs> take another town. <laughs> and uh, it went that way uh, all day and then, we were uh, crossing a field, uh, and pretty much all the company was uh, there, and uh, we had one half track in the company that was radio equipped, and uh, he cut us out, and he says, uh, "You need a machine gun squad. There's a broken down tank. On, uh, give us a general direction." Uh, they're calling for an infantry machine gun squad to come up and outpost the tank. They're afraid they're going to lose it. 
And uh, <laughs> so we started in the direction they put in, and they caught us again uh, with the, the radio track and says, you can't go that way. You're going to have to go around that forest because there's, in theory, 500 SS troops right there waiting for you. In, in that forest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had to, and this was probably 6.30, 7 o'clock in the evening, we had to go the entire length of that forest, come around and come up on the back side. We found the tank uh, about 9 o'clock, pitch, pitch black. And this is probably one of the, the rarest, strangest stories in my whole deal in Europe. That tank commander was a kid that was ahead of me in school. Oh. He was the commander of that tank, but we was probably within 25 feet of each other, but didn't know it, and didn't find out until our, on the way home. Is that right? Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> when uh, they processed us, when he was coming home back through uh, uh, Camp Lucky Strike, everything was named after cigarettes. It was what? It was every camp that on, on the you know the process and you to, to come home was yeah. named after a cigarette. Oh yeah, Camp Marlboro. Yeah, I yeah, know and, yeah. And Lucky Strike. This was Lucky Strike. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. And uh, this fellow, uh, we were living in tents. You know, we was going to be there. You know, take a few days, and uh, he knew that I was in the 20th Armored Division, and I knew he was, but uh, he was in the Armored Cavalry, and of course I was in the Armored Infantry. And the reason that uh, we knew this, the little old town of Fairfield, everybody would go to the post office first thing in the morning when the mail come in, and of course the parents would meet, and where's your boy, where's your son, and so forth. My my folks and his folks found out we was in the same division, so they said, uh, they gave me his address, and uh, of course, we worked with the Armored Cavalry once in a while, but uh, never had, you know, all GIs look alike. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, but he was all wrapped up. He had bandages uh, on his arms and his head. And I said, Kent, what's all the bandages? Oh, he says we had a little bad luck. Uh, oh, what happened? He says, well, start with my tank broke down. And uh, Schrag was gonna, gonna lose it. And we worked on that thing blackout till three o'clock in the morning. I says, uh, this kind of rings a bell. <laughs> was there a little haystack, you know, so many yards from your tank and uh, the forest trees, and you called for a machine gun squad to output. Yeah, I said, well, that was my squad, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was uh, a real strange event, you know. Sure. Uh, Fairfield, well, at that time about 450. Uh, Residents. Yeah, I had worked on his dad's farm in the in the harvest field. It, he was ahead of me in school by several grades. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, anyway, he says uh, we got that tank started about three o'clock in the morning, and about dawn we got hit. It caught fire, and I got burned. Oh yeah. And uh, uh, of course, when they got that tank started, we thought. Uh, we know what direction we got to go. We got to go east, and it don't look very safe here because we had drawn some fire that night, and so we headed off. And uh, I can't remember. We probably met with a little contingent of the company, but it was you know take another town, take another town, and we went like that all day long. Tired, didn't have anything to eat. And we had taken this town, it was a little bit bigger, and oh, there were good places to sleep there. We thought, oh, we can surely quit for the night, you know. Yeah. Take another town. Well, <laughs> it 
we were uh, just one squad, just one half track. Uh, we, that was what we was taking towns with. So our driver, whose name was Sowersley, he was redheaded and had a temper to match. And uh, he thought that we should be getting some rest. So we did have the fastest half track in the company and he knew how to get his foot in the carburetor. So we went down the road, we, we didn't know what the tent, he just followed this road. Well, the road run out, it just turned into kind of a trail. And <laughs> he was, uh, I could see the speedometer from where I was, and he was getting 55 miles an hour yeah. out of that, which is fast for yeah. a half track. And we had a terrific load, plus the sandbags and all of that, you know. It, we were a lot of mass moving, and we had no idea where we was at, what the town's name was, or anything. We was raising a lot of dust on this sort of cow trail. <laughs> All of a sudden, this road just dropped, just steep hill down to the bottom, little town, and there sat a German tiger in the square. Whoa. Gun aimed right for the top of the hill. Uh, if we'd have walked over the hill, it probably would have been a different story. But they were noted for that. An intersection or a bridge, uh, they would zero in on something like that because a double chance of getting a hit. Yeah. And uh, I truly thought that I was living the last two seconds of my life when I seen that. Yeah. I, I wondered, Will I see the muzzle blast before we're hit, or is it just going to be hit and that's it, you know? And, but uh, for a motley squad that we were, everybody knew what to do. They didn't have to be told. We just, we knew we had probably two, three dozen uh, concussion grenades rattling around in the half track in the back with us. That's exactly like a hand grenade, except it doesn't have the cast iron jacket because we couldn't have used a hand grenade because we was too close to the buildings, the store buildings along here and the square over here and the tank sitting there. So we'd just be pulling the pins and pitching them out those sides. Oh, yeah. It was pretty hard on the glass in those <laughs> uh, buildings. You know, the concussion will just take the drop the glass pieces, you know. They must have thought that the whole U.S. Army had come over that hill when they heard all of that noise. We had caught them out of the tank. And, <laughs> of course, with all the mass, we've come down that hill. Uh, nobody had time to look at the speedometer, but if we was running 55 when we dropped there, we was probably going 65 when we got. But we we kind of took out every window uh, along the way, and the first house was a big white house, and I can remember this as we shot by. This big German woman was coming, spread the the, the curtains, yeah, <laughs> and the glass just fell dropped. out. She's probably still in the basement if she's still alive, but we had to, you know, it was tempting to just go on, you know, but hey, we had to go back and take care of this, you know, so it took us probably a quarter of a mile to slow down enough to, to burn you, and I figured that gun's going to traverse and they're going to get us yet, you know. It didn't move. We had caught them out of the tank, and apparently they were sick and tired of war. And at that time, the Olympics hadn't had a, a four-minute mile. But looking out this way to the field, boots and all, I was witnessing all those guys running the four-minute mile. Doing really something. Huh? <laughs> they were they were headed for home or someplace, and we could have gone with our. 50 caliber, there's no doubt about it. But hey, you guys did us a favor. Uh, we better 
you know, keep that yeah, cool up. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we routed out the the burgomaster. That's the mayor. Yeah. And he could speak very good English. And uh, he says, "I got to hand it to you guys. You're the first GIs we've seen." And you know, you guys did this right. He says, you could have radioed for an airstrike. We didn't have a radio. <laughs> uh, and this town would have been obliterated. Yeah. And uh, he says, as it is, uh, we got a few broken windows, but we still got a town and, and we still got everybody there. Yeah. And uh, so we handed him a dishpan. We had an old dishpan and, and we told him we wanted that full of eggs. We're going to go through every building. If there's any military, there won't be. And we're going to pick up every weapon, you know, every chicken house. Oh, nine, nine, no chickies. It's okay. We'll burn your house. <laughs> we know which one is yours. We had no idea. But we were violating, you know, talking to a civilian. That was a six, oh, yeah, 60, sure. $64 fine to be talking with a a German civilian. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we threatened him, which he shouldn't have done. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, so uh, we told him what we was going to do is when we come back, he was expected to be there with a dishpan full of eggs. And we come back, I don't know where he found the chickies, but we had a dishpan full of eggs, and of course we hadn't heard of cholesterol. Uh, <laughs> at that time, and so uh, we cleared the town, and uh, uh, went on with our with our eggs. But he says, "You know, guys, I did what you asked me. Now he says, I've got to ask you guys a favor." He says, "The next bunch of GIs." ain't going to be like you. They'll see that tank and they'll just blow this town away. I want you guys to get that tank out of town. <laughs> well, we better cooperate. So we hooked the half track onto that and we pulled that tank up that hill that we had that you'd come down? By the time we was two-thirds of the way up that hill, you could smell that clutch and the smoke. But that old uh, half drag had a big old white, six white truck, you know, yeah. big heavy duty in it and geared very low. We got it up the hill, pulled it out the field, and we had a bazooka. So uh, we knew we couldn't do anything with the armor on it, but we could destroy the tracks so they couldn't readily use it, but uh, we never we never reported this. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff not reported. Right. We know that. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. So, where did you did you finish the war right there, or did uh, you? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the the day we liberated those yeah. air fellows, and then uh, they moved us around a little bit. We was in uh, there long enough to qualify for Army of Occupation, but we were scheduled for the invasion of Japan, and that seemed like double jeopardy. Uh, yeah. The uh, uh, we were uh, going to go back to the states rather than going direct to the Pacific. We we're going to get a 30-day rest and recuperation furlough, and then to California, and then on out to the Towards Pacific. The Pacific, yeah. And uh, that uh, invasion of Japan was supposed to start about the first of November of 1945, and uh, that would have been just uh, totally uh, the pits. I mean, you'd have been fighting everything. They had a lot of airplanes left. Uh, and, and there was a typhoon on top of that. So, uh, it uh, Japan, if you study history, has never been invaded. Uh, a country tried that well, centuries ago, 
and they, they you know came with their army on their ships and they had a typhoon and they lost uh, virtually all their army to the yeah ocean. that's right mm -hmm. the huns did that it mm -hmm. was uh, Attila. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so they had that uh, you'd have been fighting everything and uh, it it would have been well our officers told us uh, they showed us the map where we was going to go in at uh, our armored division and another armored division and a division of infantry, three divisions, which would be oh, roughly 30,000 men. Yeah, 30,000 guys, yeah. Beachhead was, going to, was measured in feet. So uh, that, uh, that it pretty much says it right there that uh, casualties would have been just uh, horrendous. Yeah. But Harry dropped the bomb. So mm -hmm. We like. Let's uh, let's talk about your medals now. You you have. Uh, I, I think that this fell there on the on the floor. Yeah. Now you had. Uh, I'll go through this a minute. Uh, you had the bronze star twice. <laughs> wow. Uh, I guess. Good Conduct Medal, Campaign Medal, World War II Victory Medal, Occupational Medal, Combat Infantry Man Badge First Award. But that means you were in actual combat that, mm -hmm. uh, when you get that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Honorable Service, you got the Ruptured Duck, we like call mm -hmm. that. But let's, let's uh, stop the camera. Okay, okay. Now, how long were you in the service? It was about two and a half years. Two and a half years, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. so, so you came back to the States, and you were getting ready to go to the Pacific, or at least thought you were, mm -hmm. and then we had uh, Hiroshima and all that stuff. But, but then, uh, then you got out of the service. Well, uh, it wasn't quite that simple. <laughs> they, uh, uh, they transferred me to division headquarters, where was that? Uh, when we was in California. Okay, in California, okay. And, uh, of course, uh, we were all anxious to go home. Oh, sure. Uh, we'd been out there six days, and, of course, they'd take roll call every morning. And the morning of the sixth day, the first sergeant says, any of you guys that want to take your terminal leave or your furlough, uh, line up over here. And that sounded like the line to be in. I mean, we had some new officers, and they was telling us how to shave and giving us close order drill and ankle deep sand. <laughs> and uh, it sounded like, um, hey, that that's okay. And uh, so I got in that line. I didn't know whether I think he had a little stipulation if you got money for a train ticket home. Uh, I wasn't sure that I did, but I got in that line. And <laughs> uh, my folks were pretty much surprised because I'd only been gone six days, and I'm back home. They was, oh, they oh, was so afraid. So you had a furlough at home? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, he had the 30 days at home. Oh, okay. And then we went to California. Then you went to California. And okay. then I come back six days later. They felt that I maybe went AWOL. That's course. right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as it turned out, I had quite a bit of time at home because in addition to the furlough time, they wanted you to use up your terminal leave time. So I was home uh, well, uh, quite a little bit of time before uh, I went back. And uh, when I got back, uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, our company commander, Captain Joe, he was a regular Army West Point man, and uh, uh, he had a permanent rank of probably first lieutenant. He was captain uh, then. But uh, he sent uh, a runner around to the barracks, and he wanted all of the original guys of the company to come to the mess hall come to the mess hall and never seen a big cake in the mess hall and ice cream. <laughs> he says, I felt we should have a little party. He says, I got news for you guys. 
I want you to know that I couldn't have picked a better bunch of guys to have been overseas with, and you're all great. And if any of you ever get to Jackson, Mississippi, look me up. I'll bend an elbow with any of you. Uh, I'll be in the tallest building in Jackson, Mississippi, but I'm leaving the Army, and I'm leaving tonight. And it, he wouldn't have had too much longer to go for retirement. Yeah. He, uh, I heard from him once uh, over the years. He's dead now. But, uh, in a way, he had cake and ice cream for us. <laughs> <laughs> and then good. when I came back uh, out to California, they, they transferred me to division headquarters. They was looking at what I was recommended for when I went into the Army, which was clerk typist. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I was supposed to get a couple more stripes on my sleeve, uh, but as it turned out, somebody, his name started with a G, got, got those, and they said, well, you get it next month. Next month they declared the, no more uh, promotions or anything like that. Rose of all. Uh, they combined our division with the Second Armored in what was Camp Hood, Texas, and it's Fort Hood now. And uh, so I went to Fort Hood <laughs> and I got discharged down at Fort Sam in Houston. Okay. And it was great to get home. I got home on an Easter Sunday morning and uh, uh, it uh, <clears throat> Didn't have any any job lined up or anything, and uh, of course my mother was uh, thinking that I'd go back to college, and because uh, I had started college uh, before I got drafted, yeah, and uh, I couldn't do it. I mean, I couldn't sit down and read a, a newspaper or a magazine. Uh, I had nightmares like you couldn't believe. Did you? Yeah, stress yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what did you do then? What happened to you then? Well, see, so you were what, nineteen years old? Yeah. Nineteen years old. You gone through all this stuff. You worn, you won the bronze. I mean, you, you were awarded the bronze star and all this stuff. You were a real <laughs> hero guy. No, no. And no. Uh, anyway. So, <laughs> well, we think so. Uh, so then, what did you do then? I well, mean, you know, you're uh, no spring chicken I, I now. Knew, uh, I had enough of college before I went, knew how hard it was. I was uh -huh. taking a pre-engineering course. Uh -huh. I'd always wanted to go to college. Yeah. And uh, uh, I couldn't do it. I knew I couldn't study it. Like, you know, small town, we didn't have an abundance of super teachers. So college was hard for yeah, me, and I right. thought, I can't do that. I better get a job, and so I got a job in an auto parts store, and I followed that uh, line for uh, several years. In fact, uh, when I came to Sterling, I came to be parts manager at Holloway's. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, uh, then I, I went to the post office and spent... 28 years at the post office, and I worked a couple of jobs at the same time. Yeah, good for you. So, but then somewhere along the line, you got married. Yeah, yeah, I got so married. So I've been checking on you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I got married in 1950. Yeah, had a boy and a girl, and I lost my wife in 1984. Yeah, and I was alone for 15 years, and. The gal that I married is a widow of a member of the 20th Armored Division. Oh, yeah. He was in the same battalion, but a different company. I didn't know him when he was in the service, uh -huh. but got acquainted with him. Uh, we had a few reunions, uh -huh. and that's where I got acquainted. With. So you got the second wife you met to her. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, well, that worked out okay, I guess. Well. I hear she's pretty pleasant. Yeah, well, she can she can uh, tell that story just a whole lot better than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. So, so your career was in auto parts, and you worked for Holloways, and then you worked for the postal department. Yeah, and then I, I worked uh, 
at the post office and I was running the machine shop for m and Auto Parts when they was down on Front Street. Did that on a part-time basis. So I was a busy kid. I yeah. stayed out of the pool halls. <laughs> <laughs> Stay off the street. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Okay. Well, now, uh, tell us about... Uh, okay, Evelyn. Uh, now let's do this show. Have him show us about our medals. So, so uh, stop it now. Okay. Just point to the medal over there. Okay. Yeah, what's that medal there? This is the Army of Occupation. Occupation, okay. And uh, that indicates you were in Europe or in uh, Europe after the yeah. armistice or after the war was ended there. Yeah. I don't know what the time requirement was. No, but, I uh, okay. Uh, we what's were there long enough? Yeah. And this this is a good conduct. Good conduct, okay. And. Uh, this here is uh, uh, the, the Just American a, oh, hold on a minute, yeah. uh, campaign. And, uh, what about the uh, infantry badge there? That's oh, the combat infantry badge here, Bronze Star, and this is the Central Europe uh, battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a victory deal, World War II. Victory medal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that's impressive. And, and you say those all came to you one day <laughs> through, yeah. the, through the mail, huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then this, well, that's good. This is the first thing back in civilian life, the ruptured that's duck. The ruptured duck, that's uh, what the guys used to call it, yeah. Uh, shows you were in the service. I think that's all it indicates is that uh, it was in you were in the service, doesn't it? Or does it mean you yeah. were? Yeah. 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 Honorable discharge. Yeah. I think I can have one of those. Uh, tip that bronze star up though a little bit, will you? Yeah. Let's see. God damn. Where are we here? There, the Bronze Star, yeah. Well, that's for extraordinary bravery and so. Okay, that's great.